Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Zerker. I'm the host of Looking to the East. Welcome to my show. Thank you very much for tuning in and uh, watching and recording later. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, as you know, when you, if you followed my show, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship management at Kansai Gaida University. Um, so I teach about entrepreneurship and uh, I'm also an investor uh, in uh, business firms as well as into venture capital funds. And I have one of my uh, friends, colleagues, uh, business partners, I guess, Aruna, you're, you fill all three of those categories. Aruna is the, co the, the CEO of a company called Japan Cloud. He is a venture capitalist in Japan. And that is going to be the topic of our show today. What, it, what does it mean to be a venture capitalist in Japan? What is the state of uh, VC in Japan? So we'll be covering those topics with Aruna. So thank you again, Aruna, for uh, joining us <clears throat> all the way today from San Francisco. Uh, I'd like to start <clears throat> with just asking you uh, about your background, uh, maybe very briefly talk about your business background, and most importantly, uh, how that led to where you are today. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. But before I, I start, people might be wondering, I'm actually based in Tokyo. I run Japan Cloud, which is based in Japan, but I am here in San Francisco. Um, it's been a year and three months since I uh, last came here. And I must say, I am, despite the jet lag, I am glad to be back in San Francisco. Um, it, it's the hub of technology. Uh, of, of it, there's a sort of critical mass of people, finance, and technology here. Uh, but some of the observations, just a few days here, on the good side, you know, the 101, there seems to be much less traffic, at least. <laughs> That's a great thing. On the, the, the uh, and I came in on Thursday and I was able to just walk into a CVS and get an, uh, you know, a Pfizer BioNTech shop. Uh, it seems to be like any, anything and everybody can get, uh, get uh, inoculated here. Um, but the flip side is the hotel I'm staying in is deserted. Apparently, only 5% of the staff are here. Oh uh, my. Yeah, uh, you can't get any food. There's no laundry. I've got to go, and, uh, uh, go to the local supermarket to do some shopping. So that's, those are the pros and cons. But I am glad to be back here uh, meeting with our companies. We have um, a couple of companies in San Mateo uh, and, uh, and some others in the region, plus some investors. So uh, now back to your question about how I got started. I, I am originally an, an engineer by training, an electrical engineer in computer hardware. And then my first job was in software. Did, um, did software for about three or four years moved into sales and marketing with the same firm and then ended up with my MBA. Uh, after my MBA, I joined Deutsche Bank and they sent me to Tokyo. And in Tokyo, I happened to meet uh, Alan Miner, um, somebody- you Right, know. Alan's been a guest on this show before. <laughs> That's right. And uh, that was back, I think in 2002 or 2003, he had this joint venture with, uh, with Mark Benioff, the, the Salesforce Japan joint venture. And uh, Benioff was about to take the company public. He was trying to value the Japanese entity for a number of reasons, which I won't go and get into. But mm -hmm. and I was a guy who had to do that. I was a young banker who was working on numbers. And Alan doesn't let me forget that. He, I, I came up with my final report, and which was like, well, the valuation of joint venture is anywhere between 30 million and 75 million dollars. <laughs> that, that was not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you were following, you know, financial standards and recommendations and so forth to come up with that broad range number. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I met Alan Miner, and he was running Sunbridge. Uh, and, you know, then we went out separate ways. I went to Beijing for a few years, four years, worked there, came back. Mm. As I wanted to come back, uh, I was talking to Alan again, and he said, why did you join Sunbridge? Uh, they had done, obviously, Salesforce and then uh, Concur, and they wanted to, I think Alan wanted to kind of keep building that practice. So I, in 2012, I still remember, I think it was October 2012, I, I uh, came back to Tokyo and joined uh, Alan, um, and uh, that's, I think that's the beginning of my venture capital journey. Right. So just a little background on Sunbridge and Alan, although he has been a guest a couple of times on the show, 
but uh, Alan Miner is, I, Aruna, would it be fair to say he's kind of the godfather, at least of, of foreign investors in Japan? Uh, he was originally a part of Oracle Japan and uh, helped to create that great success. So his company, Sunbridge, um, is regarded as one of the more progressive and more successful venture capital firms uh, in Japan. And I think he was also the chairman of the Japanese Venture Capital Association for that. Okay, yep. Well regarded. Um, but so when I joined, I looked at all the investments he'd been making, and uh, it was quite clear that the inbound, uh, in other words, US companies coming into Japan and his company investing in those companies were giving uh, quite, quite strong returns compared to the Japanese companies. And so Mm -hmm. 2014 or 2013, we decided to do another fund focused entirely on inbound. Uh, so when you introduce me as a venture capitalist, I, I, I am a venture capitalist, I'm a, an investor, but I invest in a very unique model, which is US software companies that we bring and transplant and build in Japan um, based on the Salesforce model. Yeah. <clears throat> So why don't you explain that a little bit more? Uh, how do you find these companies and how, why are they interested in doing this? And maybe you can discuss how this model actually works. It, uh, you mentioned salesforce.com. I think everybody in technology and even those who are not are familiar with that great success. So this bringing in a foreign company into Japan through a business agreement, a joint venture, uh, is the model there, but maybe you can explain about it a little bit more, Runa, just at a general level for our audience. Sure. Um, maybe Salesforce is probably the most uh, easily recognizable B2B SaaS company that most people would know. Um, that in Japan uh, is a joint venture, was a joint venture uh, for 10 years. Uh, you take the IP, the software from, from the US you localize it, and then you build the Japan team uh, by way of a joint venture. So Alan and his team were instrumental in hiring the right leadership, developing the right leadership, and then helping it go to market and building the revenues. At some point, our model is that uh, eventually the joint venture is dissolved, and our shares are then acquired by the parent company. And in the case yeah. of Salesforce, that happened uh, back in 2010. Uh, and I joined in 2012, it had been done and dusted, but I, I kind of helped improve the model and mm -hmm. to where we are now with Japan Cloud. Um, but I think maybe some of the nuances are, first of all, we only do B2B software, which is enterprise software. Uh, right. Not, it's not the kind of Facebooks or uh, you know, Twitter, uh, which is what we call consumer-oriented software. B2C, mm -hmm. it's B2B. It's People may have heard of Salesforce, but I, I guarantee you people have never heard of Blackline or a WalkMe or a, uh, or a Coupa uh, or even... A These are some of the current investments, right? Uh, they are companies in our portfolio today. But they are, to me, they are much more valuable long term because a consumer may, you know, may become a, um, a member of Facebook or Twitter, may use it, may not, may stop using it, whereas business to business software once you get it into a company, it tends to uh, continue for, for eight, 10, maybe even longer years. Yeah, I talk about this with my students sometimes. If you take a look at the overall software business, uh, if I remember right, it's somewhere around 70 or 80% of sales are business to business. It doesn't capture the uh, mind share of the general public. They're, like you said, more familiar with the B2C, the business to consumer types of product. But the real great market, the business interest, the revenue opportunity is B2B. And I also Aruna, worked in that area as well. I didn't know that going in, but I learned it certainly uh, through a, a long career selling software from one business to another. But getting back to your model, what, why would that model, why would Salesforce and the other companies choose to partner with you rather than go direct, which we do see happening on occasion? Why is the partnership model more successful? Very good question. I think Japan 
uh, has a unique set of characteristics which make it not so easy to, to enter and to, to build a business. Um, all the way from recruiting uh, language barriers, so you right. to recruit people who are perhaps, uh, if you go direct, you might recruit people who have uh, a good command of the English language, but not so strong from a business development and, and okay. growth perspective. So that's one. The other is there are business practices in Japan that uh, that require you to have almost a full bench. So when we when we build our businesses, we tell um, the parent company uh, it's not just a sales and marketing outpost. Uh, it is you need to have, of course, you need to have sales and you need to have marketing and pre-sales, but you need to have technical expertise on the ground, customer support in Japanese uh, in real time, uh, customer success. So you need a fairly big investment to go into Japan, uh, which a lot of U.S. companies tend to shy away from. They tend to think they can do the same thing they did in Singapore or Australia, support it from the region. And invariably, Japanese enterprises, which and we tend to go after the large enterprises, so you know, a billion dollars in revenue or more, they tend to have high standards in terms of customer uh, support and success and, and so on. So most U.S. companies coming in, I wouldn't say most, quite a few of them um, would struggle in Japan. And by contrast, the companies we brought into Japan, we don't do that many, but the, the ones that we have done uh, have done very, really, have done really, really well. Um, typically, uh, Japan becomes the second largest market for them outside the U.S. Excellent. So I guess I, I should, uh, in full disclosure, <laughs> state that I am an investor in a Rubus company, a very small investor, yeah. uh, and I had invested in a previous uh, firm uh, or uh, company as well, a joint venture fund, which included companies like Marketo and Confer, which, as Aruna pointed out, were very, very happy uh, with their partnership with Sunbridge and with this and the utilization of this partnership model. So um, <clears throat> for uh, I may show this to my students, Aruna. So I'd like to get your opinion. Since you're meeting with so many of these companies, and generally it's with the founders, right? They're still in place, so they're the founders and CEO. Do you see similarities or similar characteristics of these individuals? Or, or now that you've been doing this a number of years, when you meet them, can you look in their eyes or get a sense that uh, this is someone who I can understand why they're so successful at? So I guess there's two parts to this question. Do you see commonality in these people? And then also, are you looking for certain things in these people uh, that you think will help them? Maybe you know they're already successful in the States or Israel. It's not just the U.S., by the way. I know you, there are other firms. But do you look for characteristics that will help them uh, be successful in Japan as well? So two-part question, I guess, there. Um, I think it would be presumptuous of me to think there are characteristics of CEOs that make them successful or not. I don't think I'm qualified for that. As a professor, I'm trying to get these things. <laughs> this is how I teach, Aruna. <laughs> trying to make simple points. <laughs> no, I often, uh, uh, you know, COVID really dented my travel to the U.S. So I, I couldn't travel for over a year. But right. they, the, what I call the office smell test. If I go into a company, I can tell whether that company is on the up, if it's growing or if it's ah. pregnant, just by walking around the office, listening to the buzz, um, and, and also the kind of culture and atmosphere. Uh, and that's often a very good indicator of, is this company growing overall, not, not just in Japan, a fit for Japan is separate. Is this company uh, on the right track? Is it a growth company or is it more of an older, you know, perhaps a less high growth kind of company. Now, in terms So you need to do a vibe test, which, so you would never make an investment in a company unless you go to visit the headquarters and get that sense. You couldn't do that over the phone or over Zoom and so forth. I, I think it's really hard to do that over Zoom anyway. Right? Uh, uh, but also, uh, I, the, our joint ventures are so unique that we need to meet with the founders and the board members, key yeah. investors, and and almost um, impart uh, uh, the energy on, on both sides. So it, it tends to be that all the companies we've invested in so far, despite COVID, are companies that we have met uh, in person. At some you point. have, okay. They've come, 
a lot of our we work 100% on referrals, so we don't go out uh, uh, looking for companies. If something comes inbound, which it often does, first question I ask is, um, who referred you to us? Because our unique our structure, a joint venture, is quite unique and different, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. we need to get their head uh, heads around that structure. If they don't, if not familiar with us, then I'd rather not spend that time. Um, now I'm going to go back to your question, which is what what is a good fit for Japan? And yes, exactly. A long time now, and um, perhaps made mistakes along the way. Um, I I find increasingly that the parent has to be of a certain scale. Uh, to go into Japan or a non-English speaking geography. Uh, it's easier to go, you know, a typical trajectory is, you know, either West Coast starting, they go off to the East Coast and they go to the UK, Australia, Singapore. Exactly. That's the pattern. That's been the pattern for decades. Uh, but going into <laughs> Japanese or a Chinese or Korean non-English speaking market is much more difficult, especially Japan, which is not for paint. So, you need to be, now how do I judge that? I think the only way to do that is say how much revenue or ARR, annually recurring revenue, do you have? And if it's approaching 100 mil, and I think it, it is at the stage where the bench strength of the management team, uh, the international experience, they probably have an office in Europe, uh, maybe in Singapore, they are more ready for expand, into expansion into Japan. That, that's one. The other is, uh, I think, the ability, uh, the willingness of the CEO and the, the key team to work with us. If somebody says, hey, Aruna, I've got all the playbooks, I just need you to implement them, then there's no value add for us either. They, if, they, if that's going to work, then I, I would recommend that they go direct. But if, yep. if they say, hey, we are open to your GTM playbooks and processes and experience, and we, we want to listen to, uh, be open to your thoughts, then that is um, that, that, that's kind of a person, uh, company that we want to partner with. And let me give an example. I think New Relic. When we partnered with New Relic, um, we put up a bunch of you know, our, our preferred leader, general manager candidate. And I'm not saying the general manager is the, the answer to everything, but he had just turned 40, from 39 to 40. And uh, the immediate uh, question from U.S. headquarters, San Francisco, was, isn't he too young? He's never had any experience as a general manager, um, and uh, he doesn't have the contact. He's, he's just had a first-line, uh, what we call a first-line manager experience somewhere. And, uh, and yet, they were willing to, to take a bet on our recommendation. And, you know, two and a half years later, the, the business has grown you know, over 40 people, fantastic. In fact, wow. the best performing unit of that, of that company globally. So I think it's, it's about being open to our thoughts as well. So and maybe are- through the qualification process, <clears throat> um, and there, maybe to deal with uh, cloud, the CEO recognizes that he knows what he doesn't know about Japan. Now, I, unfortunately, because I, I've worked in, in similar types of positions, is this what you're describing, kind of being a mediator between the West and, and Japan. Sometimes the CEOs, uh, because they started their own company and they have a obviously strong initiative, uh, they think they know how to do things and, and it would transport over to Japan. But maybe through the vetting process, they, there's a tacit acknowledgement that they don't know what the right thing is to do in Japan, and they're going to turn leadership and, and guidance over to, to you, Aruna, and the other GPs who are involved in the effort. So I, you can't, there's no examples of where that's gone or awry, where you, know, you thought you had a, a more uh, compliant CEO, and then all of a sudden he was looking over your shoulder, or has that, have you been able to avoid that? We've made every mistake in the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I don't, don't want to bring back bad memories. Let, let me let me switch the topic then. No, no, I, I, I'm quite, I think the, the mistakes are what allow us to learn and we, we would then fine tune the model. You know, we've had, right. we've had to swap our general managers. I've had to step in to run, run businesses sometimes as long as 12 months. Um, but the, the, by partnering with us, the, the parent company has some level of um, comfort that we'll do what, it, what we need to do to get the business uh, growing and the business so that at the end of that joint venture, that 
platform will continue to grow for those companies. Um, and it may be um, developing people, maybe coaching people, all our CEOs, all our, we call them CEOs, general managers, um, attend development programs. We, I have one-on-one -on -one coaching with them every month, every single one of them. Kukuda, my wow. and I have uh, technically two-on-ones, we call them. Mm -hmm. uh, have, we bring them together for joint training and development. So not only is recruiting, talent recruiting is one thing, but that's the beginning of the journey. Um, and we've got to keep developing and, and, and nurturing those people so that they'll grow. And, and that's not just for the, the, the leadership, but also the next level down. So the heads of marketing, the heads of sales, uh, heads of pre-sales and so on. We, we have joint training uh, that we roll out for all of them. Yeah. yeah I've uh, been impressed, Aruna, with how well organized you are and how you structure the ongoing management or engagement with the joint ventures that I, I don't think that even the business community understands how important a part that is to the entire investment process. And maybe, uh, I don't know if you would agree with this, it may be the most important factor. You know, you can get things set up and you can hire the right people, but then to nurture them and guide them to success uh, through the course, because this normally takes, what, five to six to seven years before you see a, a final outcome. So it's a long process, which needs, it's like growing a garden, right? You have to tend to it on a weekly basis in order for it to be successful. Totally, and uh, you know, our joint ventures are long and you know, Alan's original joint ventures are 10 years. Um, they always range from between eight and 10 years. The most mm -hmm. recent one uh, is 10. Um, and it allows us the, the kind of flexibility, the, the yoyu in Japanese, I, I don't know what the English term is, but uh, to the luxury, perhaps, of, of building the right team at the beginning and, 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 and nurturing them and developing them. So right. do we have a bunch of uh, playbooks, uh, but we do have the, the benefit of time to, to build the business in the right way. At the end is, of the is this a repeatable process, or do you find that every investment is unique in that the products are different and the the people are different and the headquarters operation is different? Or, or is, it, is it something that you feel very comfortable going into that you know that it'll be 80% the same or 70% the same as previous investments? You know, um, a few years ago, I met, um, uh, when I first met Robert Smith, who founded Vista, Vista Equity Partners. Right, so famous. He yes. said to me, Aruna, you need to learn to scale. And I took that to heart. I mean, it, it is not trivial to try and get the, the kind of playbook and standardize them into certain processes that we can then roll out. Uh, so you know, the short answer to your question is 70% is similar. So the recruiting, the development. 70, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is similar. There are obviously product market differences for different companies, but most of them tend to go direct. Uh, so the, the marketing playbook around uh, you know, digital marketing content, uh, lead nurturing, uh, you know, maturity and then into sales and then post sales. That that is uh, about the same. Uh -huh. These so, Aruna, I see a book here. I, I I see a book that you and I can write based on all of your work and <laughs> my partner wrote a book. It's called The Model. Um, um, oh, he, oh, okay. He wrote a, a book. It's in Japanese and Korean now, maybe eventually in English. It's called The Model. It's probably Japan's most famous uh, go-to-market uh, model based on his experience at uh, Oracle, Salesforce, Marketo. I didn't, you know, as well as I know Alan, I didn't know that he had written the book. He's never mentioned it. Oh, Alan, it's uh, Fukuda who wrote Oh, fukuda sounded. it. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Continue. Interesting. All right. Hey, Alan, we're, or I'm sorry, Aruna, we're, we're running out of time, but there was one last question I wanted to ask you. I mean, when you and Alan started this model <clears throat> to bring companies in, and then you began to develop specifically for the cloud, I think at that point it was unique. But uh, over the last year, Japan has finally recognized that it's been an underinvesting in digital technology. And uh, I've been reading about all of these new funds that are starting. Sony and Suzuki has just started a huge fund. I'm sure you follow this more closely than I do. Uh, and then uh, uh, there's a huge one now uh, with uh, a 
Japanese founder, I think it's Will, W-I-L, I can't remember, but uh, that's another huge one. And they are looking at the cloud. So I think, uh, what, do you, what do you think about what's going on in Japan right now? I, I mean, your model has been validated by the market, obviously, with the success. But now other people are doing the same thing. So it's kind of a mixed blessing, right? It, you now have more competition. I think uh, the, the, the model is very different. The, the companies you talk about are investing in Japanese homegrown SaaS. And I think that's a great thing for Japan. Uh, you need uh, uh, more uh, interest areas in software. You need to shift to a software-defined economy, I think. And, and the more software uh, that there is, the better for everyone. And if there's a particular category, and we've got a player from the US, uh, and there, there's a Japanese homegrown, I think the interest just increases overall market size anyway. So I'm all, all for it. We tend to operate at the, the high-end enterprise level where when you roll out something, it's rolled out not just in Japan. I take Krupa, for example, we're just rolling it out with a large multinational. It's starting off in Japan and it's going to go off in France and Germany and the US. And typically we find that only the large, large US uh, software SaaS companies are able to handle that sort of global deployment and global use of all the, the software. So this uh, infusion of venture capital money uh, will be at a di- in a different area or with different types of firms than what cloud computing is, is doing currently, you think? So it is all cloud computing, but it is uh, uh, grown, homegrown in Japan, so developed by Japanese entrepreneurs and founded in Japan. Maybe, okay. And <laughs> um, other parts of Southeast Asia, maybe. But it generally tends to be quite local, domestic, whereas what we do is uh, uh, global. And, and there are certain pros and cons of each approach, but they're all making money. I think the shift to software is, is something that, that I, I'm very much in favor of. So. Yeah. yeah, I've watched that for many years, and I've always been mystified about so why Japan hasn't been more successful in the software area. Japan is more of a hardware culture. Uh, I certainly see that in the Kansai area. But the, the focus is finally on software. Um, we'll, I, I don't know what you think. We'll have to see how it goes because it, it's not just money. You need more than money. You know, like in San Francisco, you, there was a culture that supported software entrepreneurship. It, there are other elements that are behind the success of the software industry as experienced in Boston and Austin and, and uh, in Sweden now too. I mean, there, it's not just the United States. We'll have to see how it goes in Japan. Do you have a, a, a quick opinion? We're, we're running out of time, Arun, if you can just maybe wrap up. and I think the, the pieces that make success, uh, software successful, the developers, the, the appetite for early stage companies that you know, the companies here would buy from, the, the money, that's all here in San Francisco. Uh, but uh, that, there's no reason why that cannot be replicated in Japan as well. And I know Toyota, in the big software push there, they made their entire software team led by foreign people in Japan now. They're, they're, uh, well Interesting. And I'm, I'm quite hopeful that they'll make inroads into that area. All right. Well, Runa, we've run out of time, and this went by so quickly. Uh, I appreciate it. I, taking time in, uh, during your late afternoon in San Francisco while you're traveling to be with us. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, if we, sometimes we get follow-up questions. Uh, I'll forward them to you. If uh, any of our viewers have additional questions, you can send them to Think Tank and uh, we can get them answered for you. So thanks so much, Aruna. Thank you for uh, tuning in, all of the viewers. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. I'm thinking that, Aruna, I'm, I'm thinking this is totally different from software. I'm thinking of doing a show on Geisha. There's a professor at Kansai Gaidai who is an expert on Geisha. So, uh, that's what will be the topic in a couple of weeks. So for my viewers, please tune into that as we uh, look at Japan in their show. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks again, Aruna. Thank you. Peace.